Well, thank you, David. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, guys, for coming in. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your ministries. Thank you for spreading the gospel. But thank you also for having the courage to stand up and speak the truth. Um, it is important, particularly in a time like this. This is a divided time. The polarization we're seeing, the anger, the hatred, none of that is good or healthy for our country. But it's also a time when the church needs to step up. And the church needs to step up and bring people together. You know, I'm reminded of a year ago in Texas when we had Hurricane Harvey. Worst disaster to hit the state of Texas in my lifetime. And despite the horrors, we saw incredible courage, heroism, sacrifice. First responders risking their lives. Coast Guardsmen jumping off the helicopters into roiling waters to save people's lives. Thousands of just ordinary Texans who jumped on a boat to save their neighbors. Rednecks and bass boats. <laughs> The very best of Texas. You know, it's worth remembering the week before Hap Harvey last year. Do you all remember what the national conversation was about? It was about Nazis and the Ku Klux Klan. That was the entire national debate. And for all of us, it was heartbreaking to watch. How are we even debating this? What's possibly debatable about this? Nazis are bad. They're the guys who get their faces melted in Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> like, this should be really easy. The Klan are ignorant, bigoted, few fools. That ought to be simple. One of the blessings of Hurricane Harvey, even though it brought death and destruction, was the unity that came out of it was that when Texans were rescuing each other, they didn't ask, what color are you? They didn't ask, what's your ethnicity? They didn't ask, what's your religion? They didn't ask, are you a Democrat or Republican? They didn't ask, who'd you vote for? It was just Texans helping Texans. And I'll tell you one of the great legacies of Hurricane Harvey is in the days and weeks that followed, we saw the church stepping all across Texas, all across the country, stepping forward, just helping people in need. Come, come and help, help rip out sheetrock, helping people clean out their houses, helping people with supplies. And, and it was one of the reasons, I think, Texas came through so well is because there's such a strong community of churches. And they stepped forward and showed the love of Jesus. Now, Frankly, the church ought to be doing that every day. It shouldn't take a hurricane for the church to be stepping forward and engage in the community and healing wounds. And so I want to encourage all of y'all in this divided time. You have a role helping bring us together. You know, I remember President Trump's inauguration, seeing protesters here wearing t-shirts and said, not my president. And that's just sad. Look, I, I disagreed with Barack Obama on a whole host of issues. I think he advanced many policies that were harmful to the country. But Barack Obama was my president every single day he occupied that office. And that unity, remembering who we are and standing together, that's a role of people in politics will play it some, but it really is a role the church has to play. Healing hearts. 
You know, we're right now, as you guys know, in day two of the Kavanaugh hearings. Now, you want to talk about why elections matter. Very little sums it up more than the hearings were still. Now, yesterday and today, the hearings are punctuated about every minute with some angry protest test tester in the back screaming and disrupting the proceedings. I have to tell you, one of the funny things is they say all sorts of things. One of them got up and was screaming, Mother Earth! Mother Earth! <laughs> As she's being arrested, I was like, I'm not sure she's going to save you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it is... But it's also striking, there was an exchange yesterday between Senator John Kennedy and Senator Dick Durbin where Kennedy asked, said it's been reported that there was a conference call with the Democratic senators and the activist groups where these protests, this disruption was planned. And Kennedy asked, is that true? It was very interesting. Durbin responded, he said, yeah, it was a conference call. And he didn't dispute that the whole thing was planned and orchestrated. There's something really messed up about this. You know, there's something messed up about having a hearing where it started off with Brett Kavanaugh and his two little girls sitting behind him. And then an hour into it, they had to take his little girls out there because they couldn't see what was going on. Here's a crazy proposition. How about the Senate be able to do our business in a way that you don't have to take your kids out of the room and be embarrassed? But the protests are a manifestation of the anger, a manifestation of the rage, a manifestation of the hatred directed at Donald Trump that is tearing us apart. One of the protesters today said something to the effect of the Constitution and not religion. I don't want your God. That anger is not helping. You look at what this fight is about. It's interesting. We're a day and a half into it. At this point, I don't see that the Democrats have landed even a single punch on Judge Gap. <laughs> Several things are striking. One, both yesterday and today, not a single Democrat has questioned that he's qualified for the court. 100% everyone, and look, on, on any level, there's a reason they haven't questioned it, because you can't make any credible argument. He has impeccable academic credentials. He was a law clerk on the U.S. Supreme Court. He's been a federal appellate judge of the D.C. Circuit for over a decade, widely described as the second highest court in the country. And by any measure, he's one of the most respected federal appellate judges in the country. That's significant that yesterday and today, nobody has pressed in any way, shape, or form and said he isn't qualified for the court. That it is obvious that this is a man qualified to be a justice of the Supreme Court. What's interesting, secondly, is there's been very little argument from the Democratic senators about his judicial opinions. He's issued 307 judicial opinions. They're over 10,000 pages long. That's a serious record. What's striking is senator after senator after senator, they're blasting him, but they're not getting into his actual record as a judge. You know, you don't have to hypothesize what would this guy be like as a judge. He's been a judge for over a decade. You can see how he's decided cases. It's striking that there's been, there's been a little bit, but very little. I'd say 5% or less of the time the Democrats are talking, they're focused on the opinions he's issued. That's striking, too when you've got a 12-year-long record on the Federal Court of Appeals. The main thing they focused on yesterday was documents. 
Heard a lot of talk about doctors, and I gotta tell you, look, I I was very happy to see that. Because if they're focused on these procedural fights, it means they've already lost the argument. And by the way, the document argument they're making is truly ridiculous. Brett Kavanaugh has handed over more than 500,000 pages of documents. To put that in context, that is more than the last five U.S. Supreme Court nominees combined. So they've got over a half million pages of documents, and they're complaining we don't have enough documents. Never mind that you've got over a decade of an actual record on the bench. So if you want to know what kind of judge he'll be, how about what kind of judge has he been? And it's important to understand they're playing a game here. And it's not a complicated game. The documents they're demanding, they focus in particular on one thing, which is the about three years that he served as staff secretary in the George W. Bush White House. Now, what is a staff secretary? Most people who don't deal with Washington, you don't know what a staff secretary is. So the staff secretary is the person who controls the paper that comes into and out of the Oval Office that goes to the president. And so you've got millions of pages of documents that travel through the staff secretary's office. Now, mind you, Brett Kavanaugh doesn't write that paper. The paper is going to the president or being written by people like the attorney general, the secretary of state, by other cabinet members, by the senior White House officials. The staff secretary is a conduit. He takes the paper, he transmits it to the president. The president, say, gets a decision memo. He's got a couple of options. He checks something. He writes something on the paper. The staff secretary takes the paper back, sends it to, okay, this needs to go to this cabinet member. This needs to go to this person. It's important to understand the main documents the Democrats are focusing on, Brett Kavanaugh didn't write. Which means they tell you nothing about his view. They tell you nothing about what kind of Supreme Court justice he made. So why is it that they're so invested in demanding all these documents? Because they know it would be impossible to get them. Look, by definition, every piece of paper that comes into and out of the Oval Office, those are the most sensitive documents in any White House. The paper that's going to the President, the decision memos, the advice he's getting, it's sensitive from a national security perspective often. It's sensitive from internal deliberations. No White House would allow those papers to be handed over. Not the George W. Bush White House team. By the way, the Obama White House wouldn't do it. The Clinton White House wouldn't do it. No White House would do it. And in fact, there's a very good parallel. Elena Kagan. Elena Kagan, when she, when she was nominated by President Obama to the court, she was the Solicitor General of the United States. There are a whole bunch of documents in the Solicitor General's office, which is part of the Department of Justice. None of them were handed over, zero. Now, those documents are a heck of a lot more relevant to what kind of justice Elena Kagan would be. By the way, one of her main arguments as to why she was qualified to be on the court was her time as Solicitor General. That was the basis of her being qualified to be on the court. Solicitor General is the chief lawyer for the United States of America before the U.S. Supreme Court. That was her principal credential, and not a single document from the SG's office was handed over. Many of those documents she would have written. She's not simply handing them from one person to the other. The SG is the principal there, so she's either receiving recommendations from her lawyers, some of which she's taking, some of which she's not. But if you want to actually know decision-making, those documents are a thousand times more relevant. Now let me tell you, they were right not to hand them up. And you had SGs from prior administrations, all of whom said, listen, this would destroy the SG's office if you have suddenly every lawyer who writes an assessment of a case, knowing that whatever you say is going to be public, then you suddenly have people posturing for the press. It means the SG can't get candid advice. If a lawyer says to the SG, man, our legal position is really weak here, we're going to get clobbered. Well, if that's the case, you want the lawyers telling the SG that.
But if they think everything they write is going to be public, people are going to sanitize everything. And so they were quite right not to hand over Elena Kagan's SG papers because you want the United States government as it's litigating before the Supreme Court to have good and sound deliberative process. But for the very same reason, you don't want every paper that went into and out of the Oval Office made public unless you want the next presidents to know that all the advice they're getting is basically going to be made public and so is sanitized. With that in mind, we need presidents who can get advice and get advice when they're wrong. We need people to be able to say, Mr. President, you're totally wrong here. Now, people aren't going to be willing to write that or say that if they know it's going to be in the front pages of the paper. So the Democrats know exactly what they're doing. They're focusing on documents that they know will never, ever, ever be turned back over. Because their objective is to delay this indefinitely. And the real reason is something I talked about yesterday. Is they're angry about the 2016 election. And they're angry at the American people. They're angry at the voters. How dare you vote for President Trump and not Hillary Clinton? And it's important to remember, the Supreme Court was on the ballot in 2016 in a way that hasn't happened in decades. Justice Scalia passed away in February of 2016. I'll tell you what, I think there is a very, very good possibility Hillary Clinton would be president today if Justice Scalia had remained alive. Millions of Americans, myself included, voted for a principal reason of having constitutionalists replace Justice Scalia and Sir Arthur. That issue turned out millions of people across this country. And there was a contrast drawn. This was engaged. You know, they, both Trump and Hillary were asked in all three presidential debates, what kind of judges would you appoint in the Supreme Court? And Hillary was very explicit. She said she would put left-wing judicial activists on the court that would advance the policy views she supports. And Trump was explicit on the other side. He said he would put constitutionalists in the mold of Scalia and Thomas. And in fact, Trump did something that's never been done before. He put out a list of 21 names and he said for the Scalia seat that he, he would pick only from that list. That's a level of transparency. Look, the American people had, you saw the names. Do you like, do you, is, is that the kind of justice you want? Yes or no? And the American people voted, so in my view, I think the Gorsuch nomination, the Kavanaugh nomination, they, they, they have almost a super legitimacy. Because they've been ratified. We had a national referendum. And you look at a couple of issues to underscore why it matters. Issues like free speech, issues like religious liberty, issues like the Second Amendment. On free speech, the position of the Democrats nationally has gotten radical and extreme on free speech. In 2014, every single Senate Democrat voted to repeal the free speech protections of the First Amendment. We had a big debate about it. Now, they called it Repealing Citizens United. That's what they called it. But let's talk for a minute about what exactly it was. They introduced a constitutional amendment that would change the Constitution, that would overturn the First Amendment. What did they do? The first thing they did, the first version they introduced, gave Congress blanket power to regulate any expenditure of money in political speech. Under that version, it would mean that Congress could make it a criminal offense for a little old lady to spend five dollars buying a poster board to stick and putting a yard sign in her front yard. It would also mean Congress could make it a criminal offense for union organizers to organize a union. You think about everything in our political process. All of it involves the expenditure of money. Printing the pamphlet. Unless you were literally talking about standing on a soapbox and yelling in the city square, and even that, if you buy the soapbox, 
you're in trouble. That was their first version. They recognized, so they all supported that. But then they recognized that was a little too extreme. So they went to their second version. Their second version said, Congress has blanket power to regulate the political speech of any corporation. Now, that, when you first hear it, that doesn't sound as crazy. Because, you know, when you think of corporations, you think of like ExxonMobil, you think of, you know, big, big commercial companies. But you know what? A whole lot of things are corporations. So I'm going to tell you three questions I asked the Democrats of the Judiciary Committee when they were debating this. I said, number one, should Congress have the authority to ban movies? Paramount Pictures is a corporation. Should Congress be able to say it is a criminal offense to make a movie that criticizes a politician? Because under your amendment, and by the way, it said Congress can prohibit, it's literally written into the text, prohibit political speech by any corporation. Under the plain text of their amendment, Congress could ban any movie that is critical. Wow. My second question, should Congress have the power to ban books? Hmm. Simon & Schuster is a corporation. Under the text of their amendment, Congress could make it a criminal offense to sell Hillary Clinton's latest book. Now, that may be an offense against sensibilities. <laughs> But it shouldn't be a criminal offense. <laughs> and finally, third, should Congress have the power to make a criminal offense for the NAACP to speak about politics? NAACP is a corporation. By the way, so is the Sierra Club, so is Planned Parenthood, so is the NRA. Now look, some of those we may agree with, some of those we may disagree with, but what I'll tell you, every one of them has a right to speak. And Congress has no business deciding who gets to speak and who doesn't. I introduced actually a substitute amendment to delete the one they were proposing and replace it with an amendment that reads as follows. Congress should make no law respecting the establishment of religion <laughs> or abridging the free exercise thereof. <laughs> and it was word for word the text of the actual First Amendment. And every single Democrat on the committee voted against the text of the actual First Amendment. I said, I recognize you guys think you can do a better job than James Madison did with our First Amendment, but I think it's worked pretty well. So in the Senate Judiciary Committee, every Senate Democrat voted for their amendment to repeal the free speech protections of the First Amendment. Not only that, it went to the Senate floor. Senate floor, I gave a long and passionate speech. Actually, the Democrats had tried this a couple of decades ago. Ted Kennedy had opposed it. And in fact, what Ted Kennedy said, he said, we haven't amended the Bill of Rights in over 200 years, and now is no time to start. I gave a speech next to a quote from Ted Kennedy. I said, Ted Kennedy was right. Nearly gave my father a heart attack. <laughs> he was like, my son's gone native. What, what, what's happened? He drank the water. <laughs> but I'll tell you how sad it was. We had a vote on the Senate floor. Do you know how many... Senate Democrats voted against repealing the free speech provisions of the First Amendment. Zero. Every single Senate Democrat, not a one, would agree with Ted Kennedy. That's how radical the National Democrats have gotten. So why is that relevant to Kavanaugh? Well, what they can't get at the ballot box, what they can't win an election, what they can't convince the American people to do, they want five unelected lawyers in Washington, D.C. to decree for the country. That's what this is all about. It's a power grab. You know, I get all the time people ask me questions. They like one decision or another. I said, all right, you may like that decision. But how about democracy? Like, if you want to change the laws in our country, there's a way in the Constitution you do that. You convince your fellow citizens this law is bad or this law is good, and you vote to change it. Who in your right mind would want to be governed by five lawyers in robes in Washington, D.C.? 
AC. You look at the issue of religious liberty. Religious liberty is obviously an issue near and dear to everyone's heart here. It's been a passion of mine. I've spent practically my whole adult life fighting to defend religious liberty. You look at where the National Democrats are, they've gotten radical on religious liberty as well. They want a judge who will rubber stamp things like the Obama administration litigating against the little sisters of the poor. Little sisters of the poor are Catholic charity. They're nuns who have taken a vow of poverty. And the Obama administration litigated against them trying to get the courts to force the nuns to pay for abortion-inducing drugs and others. Now, I've said before, here's a real simple rule of thumb. If you're litigating against nuns, <laughs> you've probably done something wrong. <laughs> and, and it works, I promise you. This rule of thumb, you can just litigate against nuns, check, wrong thing to do. Let's pursue something else. You know, following the Hobby Lobby decision, Democrats came to the Senate floor and proposed legislation to gut the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Religious Freedom Restoration Act passed in 1993 was supported by such crazy right wingers as John Kerry and Joe Biden. Passed virtually unanimously was signed into law by that arch-conservative Bill Clinton. That was 1993. Fast forward two decades later, they decided that religious liberty is inconvenient to their political agenda. They voted to gut the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that had passed with overwhelming bipartisan support. You know how many Democrats voted against gutting the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Zero. Finally, third, let me focus on one other issue, which is the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms. You know, there's a lot of discussion about Roe versus Wade in these hearings. It's worth remembering Hillary Clinton made a very explicit promise during the campaign. She promised every justice she would appoint would vote to overturn Heller versus District of Columbia. She said, this is a litmus test and she would follow it. Now what is Heller? Heller is a landmark decision where the Supreme Court upheld the individual right to keep and bear arms in the Second Amendment. It's a 5-4 decision. It's authored by Justice Scalia. It's probably the most consequential decision Justice Scalia wrote in his entire tenure on the court. To say that every justice she would appoint would overturn Heller is likewise a radical proposition. Why is that? Let me explain. The position of the four dissenters in Heller was not that some reasonable gun control is permissible. Look, that's a public policy issue. We can argue back and forth about different people can have different views. That was not what the dissenters said. What the dissenters said in Heller is the Second Amendment protects no individual right whatsoever that it protects only a, quote, collective right of the militia, which is fancy lawyer talk for a non-existent right. Yeah. What that means, if the four dissenters get a fifth vote, is that Congress could make it a crime, a felony, for any person in this room to own a firearm. Yeah. Yeah. And not a one of us, not you, not me, none of us would have any individual right under the Second Amendment to challenge a total prohibition of defending your home and your family. That is quite literally erasing the Second Amendment from the Bill of Rights. That is the position, that was the position of Hillary Clinton. She promised every judge she nominated would have that position, and sadly, that's the position of virtually every Senate Democrat. So when you see these fights over Kavanaugh, it's not about doctrine. It's about they want judges to impose policy outcomes on the American people that they can't actually get the votes to move through the democratic process. 
That's what this fight is about. But I will give you what I think is very good news, which is Brett Kavanaugh is going to be confirmed. Yeah.